Morning, everyone. Uh, so we're going to continue on our study uh, in our periodicity unit. Uh, so far, what we've done here is we started looking at the periodic table. Uh, we saw that it wasn't just randomly that our elements are sort of arranged in this fashion here. Uh, just a quick recap here. We know we have our metals on this left-hand side. Uh, we know common properties like solid, conductive, malleable, ductile. We'll come back in chapter four to figure out why some of those properties are the way they are. Uh, in this chapter, we actually framed it in terms of uh, the metallic character or how metallic something is. You can say your, your metallicness, okay, your metallic properties increase as I head in this direction. Metallic properties increase. Uh, if you look back at that green sheet, you're going to find that metals generally, they're going to be the largest on their row. So whether I'm on the bottom where I have many shells or I'm just sort of towards the left-hand side here, I have uh, less that effective than my noble gases. Uh, because of that, um, I'm not going to have a really strong hold on my electrons. So metals generally, uh, as we start switching over to look, take a look at chemical reactions, generally metals trying to react by losing electrons. It's not just a numbers game of just saying, oh, is it easier to lose one or gain seven? It's actually because the radii are large. In this case here, metals actually react. They want to lose electrons. The physical property that we talked about uh, in terms of losing electrons or oxidation was actually this ionization energy. If I actually have a lower ionization energy, all metals want to lose electrons, but because I have a big radius, low ionization energy, uh, I would expect the radius, uh, really big atom, to actually be the one that actually reacts the quickest. So in this case here, we would expect, especially for our alkali metals, in terms of our reactivities at least, we saw that our reactivity actually increases going downwards. Uh, that's not a reasoning. You can't just say, oh, I memorized it. This side here actually is a faster reaction or more violent, vigorous reaction. Uh, you actually need to comment on, well, it's because francium or the cesium, it's because I have a big radius. A big radius means I have uh, low ionization energy. That means I lose electrons uh, easier. So at least for the metals, uh, that's true in general for all the metals. So these lower metals here will tend to react uh, faster and uh, more violently than the ones uh, closer to the stair step line. Uh, as we switch over to the nonmetals in this case here, we're going to find that the reactions are actually different. You can't just memorize in general uh, the bottom ones are the most reactive because in fact this time, when we start looking at your nonmetals, your nonmetals are actually on the right hand side here, your nonmetals actually don't want to lose electrons. So sure enough, they have the opposite. Sure enough, uh, they have a very high ionization energy. It's not just a numbers game. Well, they happen to be tiny. They happen to have most of the electrons already. They're just missing one. Is it easier to gain one or lose seven? In fact, in this case here, because we know their radii are small, you should be able to justify why that is using Z effective. These guys here don't want to lose electrons at all. These ones here react in a different fashion. These ones here would rather prefer to gain electrons. In the odd case, they actually might end up sharing electrons, especially when they're tug of warring against other nonmetals as well. Uh, but in this case here, you'll notice it's fundamentally different. They're not trying to lose electrons. And if you look at the property that you want to uh, uh, compare the reactivity for your nonmetals, instead of looking at ionization energy, you're actually going to be looking at electron activity, and better yet, we're going to look at electron affinity. We're going to start off looking at electron activity. Make sure you can define this here. This is sort of like that tug of war, but this one has to be in bonds. So basically, I put two electrons, usually when things bond together, let's say a fluorine. We'll do all these Lewis diagrams in the next chapter. Uh, but let's say fluorine and fluorine. First thing that has to happen is they have to collide so they potentially can react. Uh, usually for a covalent bond, both partners contribute one of them. We're going to see a different version of this towards the end of the chapter. But basically, we're going to have two electrons make up a bond. In this case here, we're going to call it a single uh, bond. First thing that we're going to check is electron activity. So now that they're fundamentally in a tug of war here, I want to know who wins. Fluorine is actually our most electronegative element here. You can look at table number 8 to actually figure out this number. The electron activity is actually a 4.0. Again, don't worry about the units of this one here, but basically the bigger the number, the better tug of wars. In this case here, when fluorine fights against itself, nobody wins. Uh, I think I briefly mentioned this. What we're interested in is the delta En, the difference in electron activity. Let's just go big number minus small number. In this case, there is no difference. Fluorine fights against itself, pulls equally hard. Instead of one fluorine completely losing electron and one gaining the electron, that's why they end up sharing electrons. That's why they end up still covalent. 
Uh, in the case where I make the tug of war very uneven, let's say instead I can I fight an NA against an F. Uh, I don't have the numbers in front of me right now, but uh, I think NA is on the order of about 1.0 or so. Fluorine is about 4.0. The difference here is some 3.0. How different does it need to be? We usually throw around a number of 1.8. Anything bigger than 1.8 favors the non-metal side. So fluorine definitely hogs the electrons. In fact, so much so that even though I was supposed to share these two electrons, the electron completely gets tossed over. Then I start asking the question, well, does sodium want to lose the electron? Well, it's a metal. It wants to get ionized, no problem. Whereas my halogen, it wants to pick up an electron. Upon gaining the electron, not only does it acquire that full shell, it's also smaller, so it can actually stabilize the added electron a little bit better. They actually have a higher electron affinity as well. So because nonmetals, because they're the tiniest ones, they're the ones that have uh, greater Z effective, that means they have a small radius. Uh, that means they're going to have no trouble gaining electrons or grabbing electrons. These ones will actually react based on electron activity and electron affinity. So based on that, you should be able to predict for me here, well, the size is still going to increase as you go downwards. You're going to pick up shells. What's happening to electron affinity as you go downwards or electron activity? In this case here, well, because the radius is now further from the core, sure, I might still be able to make ionic halides like alkali metals with halogen reactions. But these ones here that add the electron way out here versus something like fluorine. Fluorine will be a lot more hungry for this uh, electron. Fluorine will be a lot better competitor. In fact, the reactivity for nonmetals actually increases going up this way. So uh, reactivity increases, but it's in the opposite direction. Uh, that's nothing to do with the size because the size is generally just getting bigger. The size as it gets bigger, well, great. Metals want to ionize, definitely more reactive. In this case here, nonmetals actually want to gain electrons, steal electrons. As the size gets bigger, it actually gets worse and worse. That means the most reactive metals are the ones in this corner. You'll notice we are going to ignore the noble gases because they, for some reason, having that full shot already makes them stable. They have no desire to actually gain any more electrons. Uh, so what we'll do in this lesson here is we're going to study a few other common reactions for halogens. We're going to step down what technically will be called number 17. If you look at the Bohr model, it's only going to be group number 7. We're going to try to figure out what are some of the reactivities for this. So um, let's start off here. These ones here are our halogens. For halogens, they prefer to call them group 17. Sometimes in questions they'll say, oh, comment on the melting point down group 7. We never actually do like actual literal column number 7. So if they use column number 7, you know it means 17 as well. What we're looking at here is we're looking at our fluorines, our chlorines, bromines, and iodines. Right? Uh, so some physical characteristics of these ones here. Fluorine and chlorine, these ones here are actually gaseous. These are kind of yellowy, kind of greeny gases. Uh, these ones here are in the gas state, which means, relatively speaking, they have a very low melting point and low boiling point. At room temperature, these ones here have already liquefied and these ones have already uh, become put into the gas state. Whereas bromine, this is the sort of one exception on a periodic table, there's only two liquids on a periodic table under our regular conditions. Bromine is the one that we're going to see, it's a reddish brown liquid. The other one as a metal is actually mercury, Hg, that's also a liquid uh, under our regular circumstances. So bromine here is a sort of red brown kind of liquid. And actually going on from there, iodine is actually a purple solid. Okay. So already we're getting some variation. It's not just the metals. Oh, they're all solids. In this case here, we actually have a difference in state. And actually what we're seeing is actually an increase. This one here is still a solid. That means this one here has much higher melting point and boiling point. By the time we're at room temperature, it still hasn't melted or boiled yet. Can you give me a reason for this? In this case here, whenever we're interested in melting point, boiling point, you have to look at your physical characteristics again. We did talk about here, these ones here should be diatomic. So let me just mention that first. So these are in nature. They always appear as two. Part of the reason for that here is because looking at the halogens, they actually have seven out of the eight valence electrons. So first thing, having an unpaired electron is really unstable. That makes it what's called a radical. Radical that has unpaired electrons. It doesn't like having unpaired electrons. So it's going to do whatever it can. If a sodium comes along, it's going to steal sodium's electron. If another fluorine comes along, say I have a pure sample of fluorine, 
what's going to happen? We just talked about fluorine doesn't want to lose the electron. These fluorines will be nice to each other. They'll actually come along and they'll actually share these two electrons. So that when these two electrons spend time with the chlorine, fluorine on the left side, it feels full. When it spends time on the right-hand side, it also feels full. And that's why we end up having a diatomic. But only when it's elemental. Okay, So diatomic, whenever it's by itself. Uh, these ones here are the most reactive. I'll come back to that uh, state question in just a second here. These ones here are very reactive because they only need to gain, I'll throw in that share just in case we're fighting against another nonmetal, share one electron to acquire, we'll just call it noble gas stability. We've just been believing the fact here, uh, for some reason having a full shell makes you stable, so I'm only one short of having a noble gas, uh, definitely then makes you stable. So uh, back to my earlier question here, so it is diatomic, so let's compare fluorine as a case. Fluorine is F and F. Okay. It's a little bit weird thinking about solid fluorine because this one here is usually a gas, okay, a very dangerous gas at that. Okay. Yes, we know as a diatomic, it's actually covalently bonded together. But in fact, when we try to melt this and boil this, I want to emphasize here, after you melt this, after you, even you boil it, now we have F2 molecules that are uh, vapor. You'll notice once it's a gas, it still maintains this covalent bond. I'm actually not destroying the covalent bond at all. All I'm trying to do is I'm trying to take solid fluorine. Basically, right now, they don't have much energy. Those London forces uh, captured under the van der Waals umbrella. Essentially, what's happening here is every fluorine has positive center. Not only does it have a hold on the negatives around it, it also has an attraction to the negatives on the neighbors as well. Not a very strong attraction, but that's all I'm trying to break it up against here. Because London forces are really weak, London forces are what I've shown you in these blue lines here, you don't need to heat it all that much, and basically these have already separated. Compare that to the iodine case here, I think we talked about it a few times now. Iodine is a much larger molecule. So when you start thinking KQQ of R squared, remember that's Coulomb's principle, that's an idea that's going to carry through, especially this chapter here. We know that iodine being a couple rows lower has a few more shells. The radius is way bigger. The force should be weaker. That should actually assume that the London forces, because the iodine is actually having to reach out much farther, it actually makes it harder to actually melt. Oh, sorry, uh, easier to actually melt. But in this case here, because we see that it's actually harder to actually melt, what we're going to actually have is a competition. Yes, having a bigger radius does mean it needs to reach out farther. does mean the force is weaker. But if you look at the number of protons, fluorine only has 9 protons, whereas every iodine center has 53 protons. So iodine has way more positive attractions inside every single core. Sure, dollar for dollar, each of these attractions are weaker because they're having to reach out many more shells, but there's going to be way more interactions. Just the sheer number of interactions will actually increase the London forces because the London forces are stronger, even at room temperature. This one here has yet to even melt. So those are London forces. How you would explain that here, you still need to quote the type of forces. You can say London forces, they're stronger with more charges. And in general, we can track the more charges just by molar mass. If I have a bigger molar mass, probably that means I have more protons, and along with it comes more electrons as well. So same thing trying to hold these two together, but just the sheer number of charges actually helps hold this together. Just like in an alkali section, there are a few reactions that they want you to memorize for this. Some of them are easier. You can just predict it based on what we know already. First type of reaction for halogens, they produce ionic halides. They produce ionic compounds, which we call halides because they're with a halogen, with an alkali metal. Okay. This one here shouldn't be super surprising here. Let me give you a general formula. I'm going to take my alkali metal. Your alkali metal typically has one valence electron. Uh, I'm going to react it with a halogen. I'm just going to call it X2. Usually X is for the nonmetal. And basically, we have metal and nonmetal. We're going to end up with a compound that has metal and nonmetal. Now, I know we have to come back and we need to balance it here. Yes, this electron ends up fitting into, like, every X actually has just one spot missing. It's going to fit into that electron uh, spot, but it also needs to be balanced. So in this case here, all we need here is a 2, 1, 2. So I need two metals um, for each of the X partners. Uh, they have to donate an electron, and we end up with two MX. Uh, I can put a letter to this here. What would be the most reactive ionic halide, the one that's the most vigorous uh, sort of reaction here? Well, if we look back at our periodic table, 
Although all alkali metals, starting from lithium all the way down to francium, although all metals can go in for this M here, all halogens, F2, Cl2, all the way down to I2, can go in for the uh, leftover. We just said the reactivity, the most reactive, I know in general all alkali metals are reactive because they only have one electron on the outermost shell, but the most reactive alkali metal is the one that's the largest. So I should say francium. Again, every now and then they just say cesium because we can't really collect a lot of francium. I would expect the most violent reaction, the most vigorous one will be between cesium, the one that's sort of the most metal of the metals, and the ones that's most non-metal, the ones that are tiniest. Fluorine is a very tiny atom, really good at snatching electrons, really high electron activity, so definitely going to be most uh, violent reaction. The most vigorous reaction, we'll use that language here, most violent or the most vigorous. Okay. I'm trying to avoid language of term like the quickest reaction. We can have a reaction that's suddenly very violent, suddenly happens, uh, lots of gases are released and all that, but in this case here it may not happen very quickly. Okay, so we try to separate uh, speed from how dangerous it looks, okay? But the most vigorous or the most violent reaction that we're going to have is between the most reactive alkali, which would be our cesium, and we're reacting with our fluorine. You'll notice if I just gave you that, you didn't need to memorize it. I think the only new bit I told you here, we call it an ionic halide. But basically, I have an alkali metal, which is cesium. It's going to bond together with the fluorine. You check your charges, cesium is an alkali metal, plus one, halogen is a negative one, it only was a diatomic when it's by itself, so in this case F is stabilized by uh, CS, no problem, and then we do our balancing here, two to one to two. That one there, I wouldn't bother memorizing because you can predict it, oh, it's just a synthesis reaction, that's the most violent reaction. So this one here is called a alkali halide, or just an ionic halide, if you will. In our organic chemistry course, you'll call these uh, exactly these, uh, uh, halide um, uh, compounds, uh, but halides are things that have halogens. So that one, not too hard to memorize here. Uh, second step here, for your halogens, you do want to know that these guys here form insoluble precipitates uh, with silver. Okay. So just a recap of some language here, what do we mean precipitate? Insoluble gives you a hint. Insoluble means it doesn't dissolve. A precipitate is a solid that crashes out of solution. So here's how this works here. Uh, let's say I have some halides in solution. Let's say I put uh, NaCl. So I have a solution, maybe one mole or NaCl. We know because this is an alkali salt, once you drop into water, it's completely aqueous. I'm going to have just Na plus ions, just Cl minus ions. Those ones are fully dissolved like salty water. What we're going to do now is we're going to add in the presence of silver. Now for simplicity, I want to just add Ag+. You're going to find that I can never have a bottle of just pure Ag+. Having a positive charge actually is very unstable. What I might reach for is I might reach for a compound or a bottle labeled AgNO3. You might say, well, where did the NO3 come from? If you remember back in our solubility chapter, if it's a nitrate, it's also guaranteed to be soluble. So there's no worry that when you drop this into water, Water is just going to come and dissociate. Water is going to separate the Ag and the NO3. It's going to end up producing the Ag plus ions that I want in this case. Sure, it's going to add counterbalancing nitrate ions. Those nitrate ions are just going to float around, fully dissolve with the rest, no problem. What I'm more concerned with here is it's uh, brought in the silver ions. And in fact, what's going to happen here is silver at first was dissolved. The chloride at first was dissolved. They could be dissolved because they came from two totally different mixtures, but now that they happen to be swimming together, they realize, hey, wait a second, we shouldn't dissolve very well. They collide together, and they actually crash out of solution to becoming AgCl, solid. Over time, you're going to get a deposit on the bottom, and that deposit there will be AgCl. So it's insoluble, it doesn't dissolve very well, and we call it a precipitate, PPT for short. And it turns out this precipitate is not just a solid, there's many things that form precipitates, but these ones here actually show colors. So AgCl actually shows a whitish color. Uh, if I did the same instead of sodium chloride, if I did the same with, say, bromide, if I did the same with iodide, we'll get AgBr. It's all going to be a one-to-one -one ratio because it's plus one, and then we have a negative one as well. In this case here, AgBr solid. This one here is a creamy color. Okay, has a little tone of uh, maybe a pinky uh, kind of color. And then AGI actually turns out to be a yellow color. You do not need to predict in this situation why they're colored, but you do need to know these compounds here, silver halides, tend to be colored. 
So on a multiple choice question, they might give you four random compounds and they may say which one of these is expected to be colored. Uh, you're going to look for the silver halide. If you're given an option, sometimes they say, well, white is sort of the default color. Most things show white color. So if you have something that shows something that's definitely not white, choose that one. But in this case here, uh, if that's the best choice, just choose the silver halide that's expected to be colored. The last reaction is most interesting here for our halogens. These ones here, at the end of the day, these guys here are actually single replacement reactions. I can give it their full name here. These ones here are actually called redox reactions. We're going to spend a whole chapter on this in uh, grade 12. Uh, for our redox reactions, it's actually separated into two. Part of it is actually an oxidation. Oxidation means a loss of electrons. But that has to be coupled with a reduction reaction. Things that get reduced, they actually gain electrons. Again, it's a little bit weird thinking, oh, reduction usually means less. Why am I gaining stuff? The thing here is I'm gaining things that are negative. My charge is actually decreasing. So in this case here, again, it's very easy to uh, predict, but this is a very interesting one. For a single replacement reaction, uh, the more active, the more active halogen, uh, it's going to replace, or another language for that is displace, so just getting used to the uh, vocab here. The more active halogen displaces the less active halide. Usually that halide is already from solution. Already that halide is dissolved, like we saw earlier, and usually it comes with a color change. Lots to do with color with halogens here, and this one here is actually just because the colors themselves, uh, the halogens themselves are colored. So in this case here, let's say I have fluorine. Fluorine is a gas right now. I bubble it into a solution of LiBr. Okay. So how this would uh, look experimentally here, just like my sodium chloride from before, my Li ions and my Br ions are happily just swimming away here. This is completely colorless. I do not see bromine's Br2 reddish brown color because it's the Br minus ion. It's co completely colorless. I'm going to bubble in fluorine gas. Okay, it's going to be greenish poisonous gas here. And basically what I would do back uh, in September, we had uh, predicted this activity stuff here. If the guy by themselves was higher up on the chart, if you remember, we did this sort of activity series. We had fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, at least on the non-metal side here. If I'm higher on the chart, I can kick off anyone lower than me, no problem, because I'm more active. I can form the stronger bond. So in this case here, fluorine as a non-metal, he's going to uh, try to fight against the non-metal and the other compound. Like we said, because fluorine is more active, no trouble, fluorine is going to take the place where bromine is, and we're going to end up with lithium bonded with fluorine, poro bromine gets kicked off. Check the compounds, Li plus, F minus, perfect. Br when it's by itself has to be diatomic, and that's when I actually end up with that red-brown liquid coming back. So we bubble in this yellow greeny gas here. Over time, you're going to get a reddish brown liquid uh, mixing in with the water. So the color change is actually nothing other than going from the color of the halogen at first, which in this case here was a greeny yellow gas, and going to the red brown liquid because uh, that uh, reaction has happened. That's an indication a color changes, uh, a chemical change has happened because the color has changed. Back in the day, we had the pink sheet activity series. Based on our uh, physical trends, we can actually predict why is the reactivity this way. Well, if you look at this one here, lithium is just sort of minding its own business. When lithium was fighting against bromine, lithium had already lost its electron to bromine. Bromine was reacting by trying to gain electrons. We're looking at properties like electron activity and electron affinity. In this case here, if you look at your periodic table, fluorine has the tiniest radius, which tend to get larger and larger with the more shells going down. We know fluorine actually is the most active because it actually has the highest um, uh, electron activity and electron affinity. So reactivity wise, we want to be tiny. Fluorine is more active than chlorine, more active than bromine, more active than iodine. And anyone that's high up on the chart has no trouble kicking off anyone lower than. Uh, the other way doesn't work. Uh, so we actually can predict this here. It's because fluorine has a smaller radius. Remember, when you quote radius, you still want to give me the reason. So in this case here, it has less shells. Right. And because of that, we're going to have a greater EN and more exothermic EA. We can stabilize that electron better. It's more hungry for electrons. 
So there we go, we get a color change, we get this sort of displacement reaction. Uh, what happens if it's the other way? So what happens if I had, it could be any alkali, let's say I had uh, KCl reacts with I2, and let's react um, KBr with Cl2. Usually this question here we worded, which reaction, I'll write it down for you here, which reaction occurs readily? Okay, don't get scared away by the word readily. Readily just means which one happens as written. Based on what we said so far, which one do you expect will occur? And essentially, even without the pink sheet, because we know the comment on size, we can actually say, well, the more active kicks off less active. Unfortunately, iodine is a larger one. Iodine is less active. Iodine cannot kick off the chlorine. So in this case, you can rewrite the whole thing, or you can just say no reaction. Whereas in this case here, chlorine, chlorine is more reactive than bromine. Chlorine has no trouble kicking off bromine. We're going to get KCl, and we're going to get Br2. So again, we're going to get a yellow greeny gas, this time it's chlorine, and we're going to get bromine as a liquid going off. This reaction occurs readily. In fact, you've seen a couple examples now. The lithium completely didn't do anything. Lithium had already lost its electron. It doesn't care if it loses electron to bromine, or later on, lithium loses its electron to fluorine. It doesn't care where that electron ends up. It already has a noble gas configuration. So in fact, what they can do, the K plus actually is a spectator. This K plus and this K plus are actually just the same. Sometimes they completely ignore that K plus part and they actually write that reaction when Br minus right now is hogging the electrons, chlorine comes along, chlorine was a diatomic like this. Chlorine comes along and steals the electron from bromine and it becomes the chloride ion, chloride having a full shell. In general, this would have been unstable, but because water comes to surround it, we'll see that in the next example. And then bromine, at first it's that radical, at first it has those seven valence electrons, it's going to very quickly find another bromine neighbor so that it can have a full shell. So sometimes you will see it completely without the alkali because that is the net reaction. Just to flush out here, one last reaction with the halogen, as well as flushing out here, charges in general would be unstable. Why can this one here exist in solution and also stay colorless? We're going to look at one last problem. We'll do this as a quick aside. This will get us a little bit into the transition metal stuff uh, next week. So just as a quick aside here, there's a special name for this last reaction for a halogen. And what we're going to look at is a hydration. Hydration means a reaction with water of a metallic chloride, in, uh, metallic chloride. And in this case here, it could be any metal. So this will happen in general for alkalis, alkalines, and all that. But in general, we're going to focus on three metals. Uh, iron plus 3, chromium, and I'm going to do the example with aluminum. How it links to stuff that we just did earlier is chloride happens to be a halogen. So because chlorine is a halogen, uh, it's uh, a reaction between this group 17 uh, element with water. So hydration just means reaction with water. Careful, there's a lot of uh, names that actually mean react with water, hydration, hydrolysis, okay, uh, they all just mean reaction with water. Water is a very common solvent. So how this question is usually worded here, they're going to actually ask you the question here, explain how AlCl3 is acidic. Okay, explain how AlCl3 is acidic. Okay, so let's look at our definition so far. For something to be an acid, we know the Arrhenius definition is it's supposed to release an H plus when it's dropped into solution, which generally meant it's supposed to be H something. Right? I don't see an H something in this one. So that's why the question is a nice one here. How do I know aluminum chloride is actually acidic? So let's just sort of dig our way through here. Aluminum chloride, so it's a metal a halogen reaction. This one here is very ionic, right? metal and non-metal. It's ionic, however, it has some covalent character to it. Not super important this time, but what we're saying here, if you look at the aluminum on the periodic table, you know our metals are on the left-hand side, alumina is actually over here. So alumina is actually fairly close to that stair-step line. It's actually not going to lose as badly to the chloride later on. So it does have a little bit of covalent character. I want to just start introducing to you the idea, yes, ionic and covalent are sort of extremes, but we can actually be anywhere along continuum. We can be 40% ionic, 60% covalent. It's ionic overall, sure, metal, non-metal. Sure, it does lose the electron transfer it over, but it does pick up some covalent nature to it. 
we'll see something interesting with aluminum compounds in tomorrow's lesson. First thing that's going to happen, aluminum does have a very high charge. Aluminum has a plus 3, meaning it really has a strong hold on the Cl's with a negative charge. So although it doesn't dissolve very well, aluminum is going to eventually break out to become plus 3, and we're going to end up with 3 chloride um, halide ions. Okay, Not colored, because these ones here are uh, just in water. So there's aluminum and there's chloride. Uh, what we're going to focus on here is how can these things here exist? Charges are unstable in solution. What's actually saving the day here is we actually have the water molecule. The water is our Mickey Mouse molecule. Water overall is a neutral molecule. Water has no charge. But as we we'll start seeing in chapter 4, water is actually a polar compound. If you look at the electron activities, oxygen off the top of my head, I think it's 3.4. The electron activity for hydrogen, I think, is 2.2. So oxygen wins by some 1.2 or so. So the oxygen side wins, the oxygen side wins, which means the O side of the water molecule, yes, overall zero charge, but the O side is kind of negative, on the other side is kind of positive. So what's going to happen here is inside my beaker, for some of the AlCl3, we're going to end up having some Al ions. I talked about this being very high charge, it shouldn't be very soluble, it shouldn't be really stable because of this really high, strong, positive charge. What water is going to do, water is the background liquid, water is going to notice that aluminum actually has a plus 3 here, and water is actually going to twist itself and actually rotate itself to surround this aluminum from all sides. So my water molecules will just swim up close, and water is going to surround this guy. This is the geometry we're going to do in IB here. We're going to imagine surrounding it left, right. We're going to imagine a water coming in top down. So I'm surrounding it so far. There's four waters. And then finally, we're going to surround it in and out. So 3D here again. Okay. So eventually, we're going to end up having water actually having surrounded this aluminum from all sides. Water is going to try to stabilize this positive by pointing its negative ends. Now, water being the neutral molecule cannot actually eliminate the plus charge. But the analogy here is, I know charges are unstable, plus 3 shouldn't be able to exist, but instead of a plus 3, instead of aluminum just holding all that positive itself, by water coming around and solvating, surrounding the aluminum, it actually helps to spread out some of that positive attraction. So picture the positive as a hot potato. I don't want aluminum holding on to the hot potato at all times. That po hot potato actually gets passed around to the water. Here, you hold it. Here, you hold it. You hold it. You hold it. That positive gets spread more evenly, and that helps to stabilize it. So in this case here, uh, just for completeness sake here, water would actually surround the chloride oppositely here. So water would actually surround it. A bunch of H sides would surround the positive, which is why the chloride can actually stay like that uh, in water. But mainly we're focusing on the aluminum being acidic here. What I want to say here, Al plus 3 is actually, it's actually a much bigger grouping. It's actually Al surrounded by six waters but overall has a plus 3 charge. And here is our first example of what's called a complex ion. It has been complex between our metal, our metal with, in this case here, water. Water is going to be referred to a class of molecules called ligands in next week's lesson here. So a complex ion is made out of metal, but it's stabilized by a bunch of these ligands. Now back to our question here, how do we know aluminum is actually acidic? Earlier, Al, Cl, didn't really have any H's to give. I don't really know how it's going to donate a proton. And now what's going to happen, because aluminum actually gets surrounded by six waters, because the waters are so concentrated on actually stabilizing the positive charge, it actually weakens some of these other OH bonds that already were there. So what's going to happen here is, over time, the waters have come around, tried to stabilize aluminum. Another interesting happening is for transition metals next week. But in doing so, it actually weakens some of these bonds here, some of these other bonds here break. These reactions don't happen all the way, so they're going to be equilibrium. So they're not going to really break up all that easily, but let's just predict what we end up with. I'm going to still have my complex ion, aluminum, five waters were untouched, so water with five. The one water that I removed the H+, plus, this one here leaves, it actually does leave behind OH. That OH there is actually what I need to be a base. But in this case here, because the OH is going to cling very firmly onto aluminum, it's not just having an OH making a base, I would have to be able to release it. In this case here, that OH is not going to release. So in this case here, that uh, gives me a negative charge, and then the H plus gets lost, and phew, finally we have this one, finally we're acidic in solution. Because the H plus here is a proton, and it leaves with a positive charge, overall my complex ion goes down by one. 
this could happen again. Again, we want to get rid of charges if we can. So what's going to happen is to another water molecule later on, I'm going to pull off that other H+. Plus. This guy here is going to, again, equilibrium, become Al. I have four water, still fine. I have two OHs. I'm down by one more charge. I pick up another H+, plus, and then probably just one more here. Aluminum with three waters. All of these are uh, equilibria. So all of these, I can pick up the proton, no problem. But we're seeing how Al plus three as a chloride, how it somehow generated H+, plus, which would then make it acidic. So we'll end off the lesson there. Uh, if you have any questions, just feel free to let me know. Thanks, guys.